got the gun! He got a gun! That's video of a Louisville police officer making a tackle worthy of any pro football team. And this was the end result of a recent L.A. police pursuit. Five people in that car, three of them juveniles. Just two glimpses that take us behind the badge. And we have others to show you as we take a look at policing in America. And later, from the official biggest mouth in the world to playing your Trump card. It's the lighter side of news tonight on Banfield. Good evening to you. I'm Adrian Bankert in for Ashley Banfield. Policing in America, it's one topic that elicits controversy, patri patriotism, and protest. And most would agree that police work, it's not easy. It's a calling, and it is increasingly under the lens. Tonight, we are joined by law enforcement experts for their take on some of the video made public from officers who we, of course, are seeing behind the scenes. K-9 trainer Deputy James Craig Mile will be joining us very soon. Uh, we also have Chief of Police Jim Smith and Dr. Alfred Titus, Professor of Criminal Justice with John Jay College and a former homicide detective with the NYPD. Let's get started, gentlemen. First, we want to go to Louisville, Kentucky, where an officer dove in for a tackle worthy of Louisville's football team. The stakes much higher than any game, though. And a warning, this video is intense. The suspect is standing accused of having shot two women earlier in the day. Officers located the vehicle connected to the suspect, attempted to make a traffic stop. The suspect runs. Take a look. There he is. There he is right there. Stop, police. Get on the ground. Get your hands up. Get your hands up. Drop the gun. He got a gun. Kill me. Kill me. I got it. Kill me. I got it. Dude. It's a lot of Please. I'm just keeping it down. I'm keeping it down. Okay, I want to start with um, Chief Smith right now. That suspect was armed, had a loaded gun, and was the officer well within his rights to draw his weapon right there? Yes, uh, well within his rights. Uh, it was good policing uh, in, in the fact that uh, the deadly force was not used. And I think if you listen closely, once they have the individual down and on the ground, um, you can hear him say that, uh, kill me. He's trying to commit suicide by cop. Um, the officers did a great job uh, of going hands on with the individual um, and, and saved a life. I want to mention the suicide by cop portion of this story. I mean, that happens all too often. Can you give us some type of indication, those of us who are not officers, as to how often you all are encountering something like this? A lot more often than, than, than the general public would, uh, could imagine. Uh, a, a lot of the calls that, that we deal with on a daily basis, uh, while criminal in nature, also have a mental health aspect to them. Right. Um, and uh, it's, it's taxing. Uh, it's taxing on the officers. Uh, we have to be everything from- There he is, there he is right there. You know, and, and, and you have officers out there making great decisions in a uh, split second and saving lives daily. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We make more of the right calls on a regular basis than the wrong calls. It's absolutely true. According to statistics, uh, the latest from the Washington Post, which actually surveyed over the past several years how many incidents are handled correctly and how many are deadly. Uh, I want to show you guys this new disturbing body camera video that has been circulating now for a number of days out of Aurora, Colorado. Officers are attempting to arrest three men on outstanding felony warrants. You see two flee the scene, leaving just one man who didn't seem to move when approached by officers, and that's when this went down. Can we cue the video? Whoa, get out, get out. Whoa, what did I do? Straight down. Whoa, what the hell did I do, dude? Roll over on your face. Roll over on your stomach. What did I do? Over on your stomach. What did I do, man? Over on your stomach now. Okay, okay, bro. Okay. Roll over on your stomach. Get out, get out. Whoa, what did I do? Straight down. Whoa, what the hell did I do, dude? Roll over on your face. Roll over on your stomach. What did I do? Over on your stomach. What did I do, man? Over on your stomach now. Okay, okay, bro. 
Okay. Roll over on your stump. Whoa. Get out, get out. Oh, what did I do? Get out. Oh, what the hell did I do, dude? Roll over on your face. Roll over your stomach. What did I do? Over on your stomach. Okay, we're yeah. seeing the over same video stomach. looped over and over again. I think we have another piece of video from this same incident, but Dr. Titus, I'm going to have you come in here and explain. Is resistance defined as not obeying the commands of an officer and turning over on his stomach? Is he resisting um, arrest there? Yes, it can be conceived as resisting arrest. Uh, Legally, uh, when the police officer gives an order, uh, the suspect or the person being spoke to is supposed to follow the orders of the police officer. If he does not, that is considered resisting arrest. Uh, that is the lightest form of it. Of course, there there are more, you know, higher uh, forms of it with flailing, flailing the arms or actually physically fighting the police. But not obeying an order is also considered resisting arrest. Well, we see the officer We're actually playing the second piece of video that I wanted to get to urgently because it's what's caused a lot of outrage in the community. You see the officer uh, actually pistol whip the suspect multiple times. He has injuries to his head. He starts bleeding. He's crying out saying, you know, you're trying to kill me. Um, what the officers did here, was it simply because he wasn't rolling over? Because this was considered excessive force by their own chief yes that that is correct uh without knowing all of the details of, of of why they decided to use physical force uh based on the video it appears to be excessive there is there is no reason for an officer to start uh physically attacking attacking a individual even a suspect um unless he has a weapon or he is using physical force against the officer simply refusing to follow an order is not enough to uh cause the officer or lead the officer to use physical force let's go to a soundbite from the chief of police in aurora who apologized for her officer's actions listen to this we're disgusted we're angry this is not police work Chief, what could have been done differently? A lot. Uh, anything from uh, verbal commands. There are two officers on scene here. Um, I, I get it that two people fled on foot, but you have to weigh the totality of the circumstance here. Uh, you're watching a, a, an assault, an aggravated assault uh, by a police officer on an unarmed individual. We have the Batman utility belts with, you know, several different means of, of non-lethal um, means to, to take somebody into custody. Anything from a taser to OC pepper spray to an ASP baton, um, palm strikes. I, I, I don't know of any police academy in, in the United States that, that uh, gives instructions on the, to pistol whip somebody to take them into custody. It's lack of training and, and lack of intelligence. And so justifiably, and, and I want to bring all three gentlemen in, we are joined by Deputy uh, James Craigmile, who is here with us as well, a canine trainer. Um, this is something that has caused a lot of public outcry as to why officers continue to use force like this for what seems like minor uh, situations that should not have escalated. What is the situation here? Are we seeing more officers under stress and they're responding emotionally? Or is it just a result of um, years of bad training at certain departments? Why is this an issue? Deputy Craig, well, I'll start with you. I apologize. Okay. I didn't direct that question at the end there. That's okay. Yeah, it, it does come back to training. Uh, you train how you fight. You train 100% so that you get at least 80% on the street. And, you know, this is a case of the officer let his emotions outweigh his common sense and his training and his thought process because the, the public should be outraged over this. But we can't let this bad officer dictate what everybody thinks about the rest of us because, as the chief said earlier, there are so many more good officers out there and there's so many people that are doing good out there. Uh, but this guy will get his day in court and hopefully justice will be served. And, you know, this guy, he doesn't do, deserve to be a law enforcement officer and shame on the other officers for not stopping him. 
um, and, and preventing this this man, whether he's a suspect or not, from getting beaten. So yeah, it's a lack of training. And Dr. Titus, I know that you were jumping in there, and I wanted to allow you to answer the same question. What what is the root cause here? Yes, well, the root cause here is definitely training, but. Um, a lot of situations, uh, police officers tend to take them emotionally, and they get the, the emotions involved. Um, I teach future law enforcement officers at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and I always tell all of my students that your goal is to take a person into custody with the least amount of physical force possible. And in this particular case, we have an officer that was emotionally charged and he, he somewhat lost it here and he uh, overstepped his bounds. And, you know, that's what we consider a bad officer. And there are a few of those. But again, as the chief said, the entire police uh, field should not be viewed through one officer. Right. Well, and, and that's true of all of our industries and uh, throughout the marketplace in any industry that you face. Uh, let's go to another video. I want to take you to the streets of Los Angeles for this next case. A body camera has recently been released to the public. Many people asking why police officers don't use less lethal means like tasers or rubber bullets when they have the time to make those decisions. That's what happened right here. We have a man whose sister called 911 saying her brother was suicidal and high on meth. Officers arrive, find him wielding a knife. Several of the deputies armed themselves with stun bag shooting shotguns. And they awaited the arrival of a mental evaluation team. But sadly, the man's family had to witness this. And again, I warn you, this could be very disturbing for you. Hey, step out of the car. Yeah. Hey, put the knife down, dude. Put, hey, we're not here to shoot you, dude. We're trying to help you out. Why are you upset today? Why do you want us to shoot? Don't hey, shoot hey, right hey. Senor, hey, 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 get inside. Get in, everybody get inside. Hey, move away from crossfire. Get away. Go inside. Stand back. Stand back. Stand back. Stand back. It's terrible. I mean, the fact is, is that this man was asking officers to shoot him. He told his family that he wanted to die. He wasn't brave enough to take the step to, of suicide himself. Uh, so I just need quick answers from each of you so we can hit this commercial break. But I want to be very um, clear that this is a situation that is complicated. Uh, so Deputy Craig Mile, I'll start with you. Were the officers right to use lethal force after using that that gun? Well, you know, it, it depends on the situation. And in this case, you know, you use less than lethal force. And if that doesn't work, then unfortunately we have to go to lethal force. And there are some officers out there who don't have that good training and a sympathetic reflex of pulling the trigger whenever they hear somebody else pulling the trigger of a month of a less lethal. That does happen, but that's where we need more training for the officers. And Chief Smith, I mean, this person was reportedly high on meth. A lot of us uh, don't know exactly what it's like to encounter someone who is high on such a drug. Uh, you could liken it to fight, fighting Superman. Um, the officers are totally justified in their actions here. Uh, they exhausted every means except lethal force uh, before lethal force was used. Uh, I, my experience with individuals that are high on meth, they're almost unstoppable. It's just a very, um, it's a sad story because it looks like he's very far away from the officers. He's not threatening his family. Dr. Titus, I'll give you the final word. Is there anything that could have been done differently? Um, I think these officers did everything correctly. They established communication from the, from the onset. They kept their distance from the individual. And although he had a knife, that is still considered a dangerous weapon. And a lot of individuals don't realize that a knife is just as deadly as a gun under certain conditions. And they used non-lethal force first. They, they, they tried to use the bean bags. Um, it was not stopping the individual at, and then they had to move to the next level. So it, it looks to me like they did a good job here. All right, I know the family is uh, pursuing legal action. 
no easy answers in this one. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your perspective. Stay right there. We're going to have more behind the scenes of policing in America when we come back. Back now with canine trainer deputy James Craig Mile, Manesson, Pennsylvania Chief of Police Jim Smith, and Dr. Alfred Titus, Professor of Criminal Justice with John Jay College and a former homicide detective with the NYPD. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us today. We want to start this particular section of the show with this terrifying body camera a video released by San Diego Sheriff's Department this week showing the dangers of the drug fentanyl, even for an unwilling user and he wasn't a user he was just somebody who came upon it as part of an investigation in this case a deputy was exposed to the drug during the search of a crime scene take a look at what happened <laughs> Positive for fentanyl. This stuff's no joke, dude. It's super dangerous. I grabbed him, and he was Odin. He grabbed the Narcan, nasal spray in one nostril, open the other one, another nasal spray. I'm not going to be dying. I need Narcan! I got you. I got you. Okay, so what we're seeing there is an officer collapse in a parking lot and needing to be resuscitated by his partner because he had been exposed to some grains of fentanyl. Dr. Titus, I start with you. This is not a joke. This drug seems to be all over the place now. Yes, that is true. Uh, fentanyl is a very dangerous drugs, drug. And um, unfortunately, our emergency personnel, EMTs, uh, FDNY, police, we, we all come in contact with this far too often, and it is dangerous. So uh, it's important that police officers are trained how to handle um, these type of drugs, as well as um, the officers who are able to resuscitate an individual who may be ODing on these drugs, which thankfully saved this officer's life. His partners had great training. Thank God they were there to help him. Yeah, and apparently the, the cases of the use of this drug, which is, I, I, I hope I'm quoting this correctly, 50 times stronger than heroin. Chief Smith, can you tell us about your thoughts after seeing this video? He had a great partner uh, who, who knew exactly what to do uh, with administration of the Narcan. Um, again, we can go back to training. When, when dealing with uh, synthetic opioids like uh, fentanyl, uh, you have to you have to have a training on it um, to know that it it can kill you. Uh, it, it, we're not talking about grams here that, uh, of something that can kill you. We're talking about micrograms of a product that can kill you. Um, I believe that uh, in the United States in this past year, ninety three thousand drug overdose deaths, uh, and, and a lot of them can be contributed to to the use of fentanyl. It's, it's just a tragedy. I know it's being smuggled into our jails and prisons. Deputy Craig Mile, any thoughts? Yeah, it is. You know, I've actually dealt with fentanyl on the streets uh, before and having to actually Narcan several people that have started to overdose with fentanyl. And our agencies around here in Missouri have just said we're no longer going to field test the drugs that we're finding on the streets. Used to, we would find a drug in a car or on a street and we would put it in a little capsule or shake it around in something and see if it tested positive and then we would arrest a person. Uh, but we stopped doing that now. And, you know, the Narcan is for us, and it's not just for us as humans, it's for our canines as well. And we teach how to administer the Narcan to the canine because the canine, they put their nose directly where the drugs are. They're taught to go to source. So we use the Narcan for our dogs. And for our humans, and kudos to this officer. He saved his partner's life. And, and this, we always go back to training, but this is the type of training that we need. And kudos to the agency for putting this, uh, this very hard to watch video out there for the world to see. Yeah, the officer speaking on his own behalf saying that he almost died. A very emotional scene there and grateful that he had a partner, as you both, all three of you have mentioned. Uh, let's talk about this next story. It's a lesson for those thinking about fleeing from police. A car with five people inside and two nitrous oxide tanks. Uh, this driver trying to outrun the LAPD leading to this. 
I don't know why. I mean, I worked in Los Angeles uh, a couple of times, and it just appears he knocks out an electrical wire and pole, uh, flipping there three juveniles inside the car. I don't know why people think they can ever successfully outrun police. Um, first, I'll, ch I'll check with you, Chief. What do you What do you think here? It's, it's just mayhem. It's it's not good decision making on the juveniles' uh, part. That's for sure. But no, in, in today's day and age, you're not going to outrun the police, whether it's actual physical police units chasing you or some type of digital surveillance. Uh, there's cameras everywhere that get that everything gets report, recorded. I mean, if you look at this video here, now it was recorded by someone. I'm sure that there are surveillance cameras on buildings there that you would be able to track the the the, the travel way of the vehicle once they fled. You're not you're not going to win. You're going to get caught eventually. Yeah. Um, luckily, luckily, no lives were lost. I, I mean, that's the amazing part. Dr. Titus, would any of the passengers face any kind of charges? I mean, would the driver be the sole one who would be taken into custody? It looks like they took two men into custody. Yeah. Well, in, in this particular case, the, the driver would definitely be taken into custody, as well as anyone else in the vehicle who wow. was wanted or or on probation or had any kind of uh, illegal substance or weapon on them. They would have also been taken into custody in this situation. So dangerous. I mean, yes, oh my yes. goodness. For not just for other drivers, but just the neighbors parked there and, and then the electrical wire too. Wire too. Um, let's talk about uh, first responders because we are all so thankful for those who come on the scene of emergencies and everyone is familiar with the infamous and tragic collapse of the Champlain condominium in Florida. We want to go to the scene there. We have a body camera footage of the officers who first arrived on scene when those 911 calls were made. This was back on June 24th, a video that is hard to erase from your memory. 98 people confirmed dead. But I, go, I want to go to the images that we're just now seeing released this week. It's very important to hear how calm they were when they arrived on scene. Let's listen. Captain, hey, we, uh, the Champlain Towers, the building, it collapsed. I don't know what's going on. I can't see. Are you guys okay? Is there anybody with injuries? Hello? Where are you? Are you okay? Are you okay? Is anybody down there? You know, and, and really in seeing the full video, at first officers couldn't see anything. It's pitch black, it's the overnight hours, and then there's that blinding dust from the demolition of that building. I want to start with you, Deputy Craig Mile. Of course, they used a lot of search dogs to go through that rubble. It was heartbreaking work. Uh, but what do you think is needed in an officer to have the composure during a, a situation, a tragedy like this? Yeah, you know, you, you originally had talked about uh, what we see and what we go through on a daily basis, and that's exactly right. You know, we're going to continue to carry these memories and these thoughts and these emotions with us until we leave this earth. And the officers are going to have to go to the next call the next day or a week or two months down the road with still these thoughts on their mind. And how do you compose yourself to not let these thoughts and these emotions bother you later on down the road? And a lot of it is talking to uh, counselors. A lot of it is talking to your fellow squad mates or the other deputies that you work with and having that release uh, that you're able to know that you can communicate with somebody because these things, they really bother people. And a lot of instances like this are what cause law enforcement to leave law enforcement. Um, I work plane accidents where the people didn't survive to uh, babies that didn't survive past six months old. and. It's difficult, but we have to understand that we chose this profession to protect and to help people. 
And uh, we've just got to remember that when we go forward and we go back to training, you want to constantly be thinking about scenarios and situations in your mind, playing those out because you never know when that's going to happen. And the more that you do that in your mind, the more likely you are to be calm and to know what you're going to do when that situation happens. Right. And, and really, we can't put ourselves in the shoes of someone who has seen so much tragedy. We have to do the best we can to empathize with people who've seen the worst of humanity and the, the, the most heartbreaking story. So we want to thank uh, those who are first responders, and we want to thank you all individually for joining us tonight, gentlemen. Thank you, as always, on a Friday night. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, speaking of the weekend, let's all collectively whew, exhale. It's time for a little bit of levity. Up next, the lighter side of news. Guess what? Just got paid. It's Friday night. And you're my date. It's time to take a big exhale and start the weekend off right by taking a look at the lighter side of news. We're doing it tonight with a friend of the show, comedian Ben Glebe, host of Idio Test on the Game Show Network. He has as exciting a social life as I do right now. Also, a big welcome to first time guest comedian Ken Krantz, host of the I Love Rock and Roll. I want to I Love Rock and Roll podcast. <laughs> idiot Test, Idiot Test versus Idio. <laughs> You just failed the test. <laughs> well, you can tell I'm trying to be funny like you guys, and I'm not really succeeding. So we're going to let you guys be funny. And I'm going to be the one who's the straight guy, OK? Um, so thank you guys for being with us on Friday night. And I want you guys to meet a woman named Thanks Samantha. Thanks for having me. Oh, yes, absolutely. Wait till you see this oh. one. What's also, up? for the record, I'm going on date night right as soon as we're out there. <laughs> okay. I don't know what your plans are. <laughs> Good. Then, then you are doing pretty good for yourself. Aren't you married? No. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe you will be after tonight. Uh, let's let's meet this young lady, uh, a woman named Samantha Ramsdale from Connecticut. She's she's awesome, right? She set a Guinness World Record this week. For the let's just roll the tape. I mean, I like to think maybe I could be wrong, but like I look semi-normal. Like you know, as I'm walking down the street, it's not until I go. Some of my friends were like, what? I had no idea it was that big. Uh, Ken, it turns out she can stuff an entire large order of McDonald's french fries or a large green apple in her mouth. What do you think? Well, I, I think I this that. feels like a. I think this feels like a trap. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said Ken. <laughs> you did. You did. I think I, this I feels like a trap. <laughs> it feels oh. like a trap? You <laughs> I think you... Yeah, I think you're trying to get me canceled a year from no. now for, for making jokes about this lady's mouth. No. Um, I, I was reading I was reading that she was bullied for this yeah. her whole life. And um, now she's got a million and a half Instagram followers. And yeah. uh, I think I think it's wild. I think the joke's on those people who bullied her. That's what I would say. Um, yeah, but, I mean, but is, also the is it, though? Just, yeah, the joke is also on all of society because... It's literally insane what it takes to get followers these days. Over a, one and a half million followers, even adjusted for mouth inflation, that's a million. <laughs> I need that kind of follower. Ever since I heard about her, I've been doing mouth aesthetics. I've been using fish hooks. I'm trying. I'm still at like five followers. Yeah, Not you, might, you, you might get more dates if you had the biggest mouth. I mean, Guinness World Record Maybe. for it. Maybe. We're I'm, showing more video. I'm just depressed that she's going to have a Netflix special before me. Oh. <laughs> yes, it's true. Celebrate her. And she her. also sings a ton on her, on her TikTok, <laughs> which I don't know if she realizes that's not what having a big mouth helps with. It's just for shoving food in there. It's not going to help you sing better. Are you saying that she doesn't have a good voice? No, it's actually kind of lovely, but I just okay. think the mouth thing doesn't help. Yeah, more projection. You just mm -hmm. From fair. the diaphragm. Okay, let's go to another story. How about that? Okay, we've all heard the expression, does a bear you know what in the woods? I actually have never heard that saying. I, I know like the one where the tree falls over, does it still make a sound? Anyways, here's a video where I'm pretty sure it was the humans who were more likely to have an accident in the woods. They were on a guided tour in Alaska when this happened. Hey, big boy. You guys got a camera out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, big boy. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, Bear. Okay, you're hearing the tour guide's voice. Hey, Bear. <laughs> hey, Bear. <laughs> I'm thinking, hey, did he learn that in earlier tours, that if he just called the bear, bear, that they'd be okay? Uh, I don't know that I would be that cool. Ben, what do you think? Well, it's a very intense situation. This bear clearly wasn't interested in them. He was more interested in seeing his own picture on that sign. <laughs> he was just going to check to make sure his headshot was still up. And people don't know this, but there's no risk of being attacked by a narcissistic bear. Uh, bears, bears that like are into their own thing. Maybe they'll ask you to take a picture of them. That's about it. If I were them, I would just be asking myself, what's so boring about me that even a hungry bear is not interested? Oh, my God. I would go into a period of self-reflection, probably. <laughs> I mean... I'm just looking at the bear, and it looks like it has war wounds. You know, patches of fur seem to be missing. I'm thinking, was the bear in a fight right before this, and is he looking for more? I, I don't know, Ken. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that tour guide gets paid, but they need to triple it, because I would have pushed the family out oh, no. in front of the bear <laughs> and ran for the hills. And also, bears are so scary that he saw a picture of himself, like, hey, bears are here. And he got the hell out of there. Well, you're right. He turned right around. Good point. You, yeah. You're very observant, Ken. We're, we're going to have to have you on again. <laughs> Let's talk about this. I would this. love that. Yeah, we'd love to have you. Listen to this. You probably saw the story. We call him Frontier Bra right now. Um, he's 22 years <laughs> old. He was on a flight. He reportedly had a little to drink. Um, allegedly, it got worse from there groping a couple of flight attendants, fighting with another flight attendant, who happens to be a man. Uh, nothing else would work to subdue this guy, so the crew took these steps. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> On the one hand, I do feel for the guy because clearly he's just But at the same time, I'm thinking, what is wrong that you would do the things you did on a I just, I cannot fathom. I can't fathom what he was thinking um, or what he was drinking. Ken, uh, prior to being restrained, <laughs> he was screaming that his parents were worth $2 million and his grandpa was a lawyer. And we want to show what right. led up to the duct tape incident. So we got to show you another soundbite. You guys suck. My parents are worth more than $2 million. And you know what? You suck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know what? My grandpa is worth more than that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I feel for the guy anymore. I apologize. Um, ben, have you ever, yes. I know you fly in first class all the time, but what's your take on this? Uh, not only do I not fly in first class, but I also try to avoid Frontier Airlines typically. Um, but maybe my family would have $2 million if I made better decisions with my money, started saving and stopped flying Frontier, started flying Frontier rather. So that's an idea. I don't mind this. I actually now want to fly Frontier considering that they duct tape this person I have respect for this flight crew. I think it should be a law in society. Anyone should be allowed to duct tape somebody down whenever they say, don't you know who my parents are? You oh. get automatically duct taped in place <laughs> and people get to laugh at you for 92 hours. That's my policy. And I'm saying this full well knowing that his grandpa's a lawyer. So he might, you know, try to take me down with some old timey law. Like if, if I get found guilty of this, I get nine less lemonades or something, but I'll take my chances. It's just, it's a sad story on like 15 <laughs> different levels, especially for those flight attendants who have to deal with so much drama, right, Ken? Yeah, I, I like that he's yelling, my parents are worth $2 million and he's still flying Frontier. Like your parents don't even like you enough to send you on a good airline. <laughs> and um, I wish they hadn't duct taped his mouth shut before we found out what the rest of his family did. You know, like my grandpa's a lawyer. My aunt's a guidance counselor. She makes 60K, but pretty good benefits. 
<laughs> my cousin drives a garbage truck. We have I, a I, uh, tree, I think Ken. that's another. Yeah. If I were the yeah. flight attendant, they, they duct taped his mouth before we found it out. All right. Well, ben, I would have pulled a Harrison Ford and Air Force One, opened the door, and been, get off my plane. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've got to save something. Leave the people wanting more, Ben and Ken. We're going to be right back after this break. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. And back now with comedians Ben Glebe and Ken Krantz. Okay, we're going to do this as a lightning round of sorts, okay? So I'm going to read a topic, and then I'm going to call your name out, and I'm going to let you say one quick first thought once I read the story, okay? Is that fair? Loves it. Okay. So I'll say your name, and that's how you know to go. Former President Donald Trump's Political Action Committee sent out emails to supporters this week spreading the word about the Trump card. It's a good sales tactic. You have to give them that. Check it out. It's not a credit card. It's not a debit card. It's not a gift card. But according to the email, they will be a sign of your dedicated support to our movement to save America. And I'm putting my full trust in you. That is a quote from President Trump in the email. A second email read, in part, we're about to launch our official Trump cards, which will be reserved for President Trump's strongest supporters. Ken, first thought. Uh, my first thought is, let's just call this what it really is, a passport for the unvaccinated. <clears throat> <laughs> ben, first thought. My thought is, <laughs> he's finally not asking people to put their trust in him, but instead he's now trusting others. That's progress. I would criticize this, but I literally have for my followers a Glebe card that they can <laughs> subscribe to my Patreon. <laughs> And so this one, I give them a pass. Why do you have a pair of scissors, though? Are you about to cut up your card? <laughs> Just to show that it's metal. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's legit. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, You can't man. cut this card. It's made in America, unlike his probably made in China cards. Just saying. All right. Next story. We're going to do this again. All right. The story of the Tokyo Olympics was, of course, USA gymnast Simone Biles removing herself from team competition, focusing on her mental health. She later returned to win a bronze medal in balance beam. But the number one, number one, rather, ranked tennis player in the world, Novak Djokovic, also competing in the Olympics, though supposedly not referring specifically to Biles, was quoted at one point saying, pressure is a privilege, my friend. Without pressure, there is no professional sport. If you are aiming to be at the top of the game, you better start learning how to deal with pressure and how to cope with those moments. Here he is under the pressure of competing for his own bronze medal. Oh, what a point. Oh, Novak just threw his racket in the stands. Good thing there's no crowd there. Wow. And again. Oh, toast. Oh, painful. Djokovic failed to medal. Simone Biles took home bronze. Take a look at The Daily Show's Roy Wood on the subject. Why are you blaming the racket? The racket does what you tell it to do. It ain't the racket's fault. If anything, the racket should be smashing your ass. Wait, hey, do you hear that sound? That's the sound of everybody who said Simone Biles was too emotional, who ain't saying shit about this man smashing a tennis racket. Okay, again, Djokovic never specifically saying that that comment had anything to do with Biles. But lightning round, Ben, first thought. Well, I think it's what the, me the message here is clear. It's not emotionally stable to take yourself out in advance for your own mental health, but during the event to completely lose your SH, whatever the rest of the word is, that's normal. Ken, first thought. Uh, my first thought is, as a grown man, I'm going to continue never having an opinion on women's gymnastics. And also, um, you know, she's not getting paid to go to work. And I wonder how many of us would get paid to, to would, would go to work without getting paid, besides comedians. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say deep thoughts with Ken. <laughs> All right, Ken <laughs> and Ben, I love that your names rhyme, and I love that you're going to be with us one more time. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Banfield, and welcome back to our comedians, Ben Glebe and Ken Krantz. Okay, you guys both, of course, comedians for a living. You tell your jokes. Sometimes jokes can cross the line. You'd never do that here. But let's take a look at a clip from the new animated HBO Max show, The Prince. It's about the royal family. Take a look. Hey, Owen. Yes, your royal highness. When you're clipping my nails, can you at least try to act like you're enjoying it? My toes are absorbing a lot of your resentment. I would never want you to think that I didn't... <laughs> Less talky, more clippy. Ooh, Kelly Ripper just posted a throwback Thursday photo of her eating a bagel on the set of All My Children. OMG, coffin emoji. I love Kelly Ripper. And the show is based, of course, on Prince George, who happens to be a real-life person. He's only eight. Ben... Should eight-year-olds be off limits in comedy? I think it's probably a good rule of thumb to keep eight-year-olds off limits, especially in the royal family, because that family's full of adult children you can make fun of. Oh, my goodness. Ken, <laughs> what are your thoughts? <laughs> my thoughts are that if I was eight years old and they made a cartoon about me, I would be the happiest kid on the planet, and I would never stop shoving that down my friends' throats. I don't think it should be off limits. Let's watch another clip just to see if we can change your mind. <laughs> he looks good. Fit. Hey, shut up. You shut up. <laughs> yeah, you look amazing today, Gampa. This is a sexy family. You know, for British people. Now, I remember reading an article, the creator of the show cutting out certain images, including Prince, uh, or rather, uh, yes, uh, Philip, because he had passed away in April. So they actually delayed the release of the show. But, you know, nothing off limits with the royal family, do you think? No, I think the no, rest. No, I don't, I don't think. I apologize. I should say Ben or Ken. Let me start with Ken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do think it's it's funny that they, you know, they they were more concerned about a 119 year old dying than than the eight year old. But no, I don't, I don't think anything should be off limits with the royal family. <laughs> yeah. Ben, I have like eight seconds. Well, I'm just saying kids in general shouldn't be made fun of, except my son, Greg. Very annoying. And he's fair game. So come at him. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Glebe, we love you. OK, Ben, Ken, thank you so much. I know you've got some comedy shows coming up. Make sure to check them out. We'll see you next time on Banfield. Ashley's back next week. See ya.